All right. Let's, let's get, get into, into it. it. Oh, it's Friday, John. Oh, it is. I had to go solo last week. Yeah? I talked to myself. Yeah? And Justin. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it went I'm well, sorry. though. I think it went well. I'm sorry I wasn't here. Yeah. Well, we well. Uh, we got to answer a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, speaking of that, we got any new ones? Uh, that's a good question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll circle okay, back. We'll, yeah. we'll start talking. You let us know if you <laughs> yeah. find anything. Uh, uh, but yeah, I'm back. Last week, I, I was uh, I, w- I was out of the country. And I was in Honduras. But not for cigar. Uh, yeah. Things. As you would assume. Because, yeah, normally you go to Honduras, it's for cigars. Especially, with, yeah. But so I ended up going to Roatan, Honduras, which is an island uh, just north of, of mainland Honduras. Um, and they do a lot of scuba diving there. And so I went down there with a, a nonprofit called Warfighter Scuba. Not um, related. Not related at all. Uh, <laughs> but a uh, similar mission in. in in life, maybe if you want to call that, um, you know, just helping out our own community the best we can with what we got. Uh, but they do a lot of dive trips. Um, well, we had, we had Nick. Yeah. We had Nick on earlier. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't really have to go into detail on that. Yeah. If if you want, if you want, (laughs) but for the listeners, if they haven't listened to that one, there should be an episode either titled what's Nick's last name, uh, Nick powers, Nick powers or, or warfighter scuba. One of the two. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we were down there for that. Uh, if, uh, and just to throw it out there, if you, need, you guys want more information about Warfighter Scuba, go to warfighterscuba.org because they are a nonprofit. So it's .org, not .com. Um, or check them out on social media, Warfighter Scuba on Instagram, Facebook, all that fun stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we went down there and they, this was what they call their first reunion trip. Uh, so the, everyone that was there were guys that already went through the, the uh, basic open water course. Um they uh, they're already dive certified. They already got some dives under their belt, whether it's through you know with Warfighter Scuba when they got their initial certs done, or if they've dove since then. Um, so, but we had guys that had you know 10, 12 dives. We had guys that had you know ninety dives. So it, there was a, a wide variety of skill levels that were down there with us. Uh, but what we were there for was to do this. They call it the classified dive buddy or classified diving. And it sounds like fancy, like oh we're going to be blacked out. Well, according you know. to uh, AI, we we were Navy SEALs at one time. I know. So it's, That's true. Yeah. And there was a Navy SEAL instructor, Oops. or a Navy SEAL that was down there as one of the instructors. There you too. go. There you go. It's um, classified. That's the end of the story. Yep, that's it. I can't talk about the rest. <laughs> um, so until next week, thank you guys. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so it's called Classified Die Buddy. And uh, essentially what it is, is we are learning and getting certified to be able to di- be a dive buddy for guys that are paraplegic, quadriplegic, uh, above or below the knee, above or below the elbow amputees, um, you know, that have serious physical, you know, disabilities or things going on and how we can facilitate, oh, blind divers, um, which I'll go into some of the uh, more details on that. Cause when I first, you know, like, oh, it's a blind diver. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, but so we, we got to learn a lot. Like I learned so much on this trip. Um, and it really helped a lot. And there's a lot of things that I would never have even thought of, um, when it comes to, you know, like I understand like, okay, like this, this guy's missing legs or he's, you know, paralyzed from the waist down. Right. Uh, but I don't know like all the little intricacies that go on with the people that are paralyzed and yeah. things that could happen and because they have no sensation, the difference in buoyancy, they have no strength. So they'd have less muscle mass. So their legs kind of just do whatever and float. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but then they also have internal things that they have to worry about. Like, uh, you know, say one of their legs, something was pinching it. They don't feel it. Oh, yeah. But eventually it'll send a, a, a kind of fight or flight signal into their body. And then their breathing changes and everything changes, but they don't know why. Mm. And so it teaches us to pay attention to look for this and then start assessing the situation to figure out what's causing this so that we can calm them back down and right. then go back into regular diving. Um but it was it was amazing. We had a huge group. We had I think we had twenty people total, which is kind of chaotic. Uh, but we had at one point we had four instructors, myself as a dive master, um, a couple other experienced divers that were on the group too. So I mean it was very safe. We all of our numbers mapped out what we needed for instructor versus student and stuff like that. So, um, but it was a really really good time. Uh, and then a lot of the guys we got them their stress and rescue certs. 
Um, so now they're rescue divers. And uh, a couple of the guys that did that were um, right leg amputees. And so it's pretty interesting when you're just a passerby on the beach and you're watching this guy getting towed in and you're like, is he, is he okay? Or is this training or, or did he meet a shark? Yeah. Like what's going what's on? Guy? And then like, you know, the guy that's like the, the, you know, the guy being rescued, he's an able bodied person, but he's just acting like he's, you know, right. passed out or whatever. And then the guy drops all the equipment and he stands up to pull the dude onto the shore and he's only got one leg. <laughs> the guy's standing up pulling, you know, and so like the, the people who are on shore were just like, what is going on? Like, do you need help? Do you need us to call 9 We're like, ma'am, no, we're, it's just training. We're okay. <laughs> but it is pretty cool. Um, is it 911 in Honduras? I think it's 112 or something. Hmm. It doesn't matter. But it was funny, though, because like it just because of where we live and what we do, it's, you know, and we're instructed that, you know, you, you get a hold of somebody to have them, you know, Call 911 or, you know, yeah. get EMS, get a hold of somebody, get first aid, O2 kits or, you know, whatever, next level care type deal. And so you're like barking out directions as you're pulling this dude onto the beach. Yeah. And like the people that are on the beach, they don't know what we're doing this. Right. <laughs> so there's one, there's one couple that uh, actually I was getting pulled up uh, by a right leg amputee. And, uh, and so they pull me out, they rip all my gear off, they get me up on the sand, and I'm not a light person. Right. And this guy only has one leg. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm impressed that he got me where, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck yeah, man. Like, you you legitimately could save me if something was wrong. Yeah. This is awesome. And that was the whole point of the training. But right. uh, so he gets me on the beach, you know, look, listen, you know, for uh, my mouth, making sure, you know, I'm alive or not. It's part of CPR because we also did first aid CPR search yeah. while we were there. And then he, you know, started quote unquote CPR, you know, mock breaths and, yeah. then, you know, like quarter compressions, yeah. but just going through the motions. So, you know, and uh, to somebody just sitting there, they, they wouldn't know any better. Right. So this couple, like literally like, oh my God, like, what can we do? How can we help them? Blah, blah, blah. And the guy's like, oh, it's fine. We got this. And he just keeps going, you know, and I'm just, and I'm just, I still have my eyes closed yeah. and whatever. And then they like kept going. And finally, like I opened my eyes and I lifted my head up. I'm like, I'm like, guys, I'm like, I'm totally fine. We're doing a stress and rescue dive certification course right now. This is just part of the training, you know, blah, blah, right. blah. And then the husband, like they were a little older couple. The husband's like, <laughs> this is my, we just got to the, this is my first day on the beach. We just walked down here, been on the beach for about two and a half minutes. And this is the first thing I see. <laughs> and he goes, what happens later on the, on the road that, you know, while we're here and this actually happens, I don't know if it's fake or not. <laughs> I was like, well, I was like, sir, I appreciate you. I was like, yeah. Thanks. I was like, but we're just doing training right now. Um, but no, it was super cool. So we got out of the, out of the whole group that was down there. We got 15 people certified stress and rescue and CPR first aid as well. Um, and then we got a bunch of other search for some other guys. Like we had a couple of guys that got their full face, you know, mask certifications, um, which, you know, depending on what is going on, that it helps with, you know, if they have certain disabilities or trouble, you know, right. Um, you know, taking on and off a mask or something. Uh, so it, it was just, it was, it was very, humbling um to work with the guys for a week straight doing some very very strenuous physical activities and they're missing legs and you know the best attitudes and the best spirits yeah. and super motivated and you know as tired and uncomfortable or whatever they were they you know just did everything and obviously there's adaptations that you have to do but they didn't want any like special treatment. You're like, right. cause I was like, look, I'm like, I'm like 265 pounds. You don't need to pull me completely out of the sand. Like, yeah, I do. If this is a real rescue, I had to. And I yeah. was like, well, fuck it. Yeah. I'm just going to be limp then. You know, yeah. <laughs> like I would have helped kick. They're like, right. don't. And I'm like, fine. So, um, you know, super motivating, but, uh, but yeah, that was super fun. Um, and then we got to do, you know, to tie cigars into it. Um, you know, on all these trips, I always bring cigars down there. And so we did a little, kind of campfire action minus the campfire right. uh, in the evenings after all the dives. Um, Did you guys get in the pool after being in the water the whole time? So I, I didn't, but I know some of the, some of the yeah. guys. I stayed, I stayed uh, off the, the resort. Right. Um, I stayed with, with Nick from Warfighter Scuba um, just because it, it worked out a little bit easier that way to help plan and, and facilitate things for the next day and move equipment around and whatnot. Um, and it was one last hotel room that Warfighter Scuba had a supply. And, right. You know, I'm not a Purple Heart recipient, and this program is specifically for those. So, you know, I kind of talked with Nick beforehand, and 
you know, however we can get more funds for the, the nonprofit, I'd rather do that, yeah. you know? So, uh, but it worked out really well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the campfire talks afterwards, uh, you know, the guys hanging out, smoking cigars together. Um, you know, there were guys that like, don't really smoke that often that, you know, we're like, wow, like this is like much more of an experience than I thought it would be because, right. you know, I, and now I'm, I'm extremely good friends with a lot of these people where normally I, we'd call it a day. Everyone was exhausted. They go to the room, they call it, you know, yeah. that's it. And so now it gives them a reason to hang out and bullshit for an hour together. Yeah. Yep. Which is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Justin, I think you have a, a video. Uh, I do. This is just give the, you know, the, the listeners or watchers, just an idea of like where you are, what you're doing and yeah. kind of the atmosphere. You know? Yep. And uh, so actually this dive site on this video, um, it's called um, Mary's Place. And it's a kind of a, a very well-known dive site in Roatan. Um, it's uh, some of the GoPro. So I was, I was guiding a group. So some of the GoPro footage is just me. The GoPro is clipped onto my, my, my BCD, my buoyancy control device. And so if I'm trying to make sure I got people or gain information or whatever, I would just let it hang. And so right. it's just hanging right now. And that's why it's just chaotic in the video. Uh, so I apologize to get motion sick if it's upside down or backwards or whatever. So this one guy's not, he's not kicking very well. No. Um, yeah. So that's Steven. Steven, Steven's like Lieutenant Dan. He ain't got no legs. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, all these guys, um, that, you know, missing limbs and stuff is from, uh, you know, something that happened while they were overseas, right. uh, whether they got shot, they got blown up or, you know, whatever it was. Um, but this, like Steve, for instance, he spends the majority of his time in a wheelchair. Yeah. And until we put him in the water and he has complete and total freedom. Right. Upside down, left, right, down, swim. It yeah. doesn't matter That's because awesome. gravity's a little bit different there. Um, and there's a guy, right leg amputee. That's the guy who, who pulled me up on shore. Um, and so if you could see, his fins are really long. So he's diving with free dive fins, the longer ones. Right. So it helps with extra propulsion. Right, right. Um, instead of the scuba fins, which are a little bit shorter. And then you were telling me about the uh, the, the two-legged amputee. He was using uh, special gloves. Yeah, so they have webbed gloves. And uh, so essentially, like, that's how he got around. He just used his hands and, and just kind of did, like, a breaststroke the whole time. Right. Um, but, I mean, his shoulders are they're just going to be massive. Yeah. Uh, but you could tell, you know, towards the end of the dive, he'd, he'd, you know, he, he'd get tired just cause you know, it's a tiring yeah. activity. It really is. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And so on, on what would you rate like this being clear to me? This is very clear water. Oh, it really is. Yeah. Um, so we, we had a little bit of a current that day. We had some storms that came through. So there's, I mean, the, the visibility is phenomenal. Um, I'm spoiled in some of the dive sites that I've been to. So like, I would say, I think when I got back, when I first showed you guys this video, I was saying that it was, it, the visibility was, it was good, but it was a little cloudy at mm -hmm. points. What I mean by the cloudy is if you look into the depth, right, it looks hazy. Right. But the thing that you got to factor into there is right now we're probably at like 40 feet and at the bottom where it looks hazy is like 130 yeah, so that's a long. It, that's so a that long means it's like ninety foot visibility, yeah. and you're already at depth. You know, like down there where it's hazy on the right. bottom, that's like 130 feet deep down there. Yeah. Um, and so this is towards the end of the dive. We already had guys. I, I led a group that stayed between 40 and 60 feet. We had guys that went down to that you know 100 120 area. Um, you burn through gas a lot faster at depth, uh, so it's a much shorter dive. Um. But you can see he's got, see, he was just saying he's a little tired. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's beautiful coral. The reefs are amazing. Um, there wasn't that much life on this dive. And I think it's because there, it was, it was an afternoon dive that we did. And there's a liveaboard that was anchored, moored, that was, you know, near this. And uh, so I think this dive site probably already saw 50, 60 people already that day. Right. And so all the, the marine life is just like, mm, yeah, we're all set. Thanks. We're just going to hang out until this evening. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we're, we're making our way back up towards uh, about 15 feet to do a safety stop. And we hang out there for about three minutes just to let all the off gassing happen in our body to make sure we're safe before we surface. Um, it's not a mandatory thing, but it's highly, highly recommended on 
on your dives. Typically, you only have to do it if you go past 60. Right. Uh, we do it on every single dive, no matter what the depth, just, you know, extra precautions. Um, but one of the cool things on this site that I was looking for is if you see all the, the coral, how it's all waving. Uh, so there's a current that goes by, um, by this dive site all the time. And so you have a very good chance of seahorses, the little tiny guys are only like they're tiny, right? but they'll wrap their tail around some of these pieces of coral and just hang out. Oh. Uh, cause they can't really swim. They just go with the current, you know, so that they, that holds them on then they can eat or, you know, do whatever they're doing. So I was looking for them and, uh, I, like I said, I didn't really get to see any of them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, uh, while we were down there, I mean, there was so much stuff that, you know, I was there for a week. So trying to condense a week into, you know, 30, 45 minutes or an hour, it's really hard. Uh, but we did have some, some interesting experiences. Um, the food is phenomenal as always, uh, in Honduras, they have, uh, this breakfast, um, and they, they call them baleadas and it's almost like a breakfast taco, a breakfast burrito. Um, it's home, a homemade fresh tortilla, and then they usually some seasoned meat and eggs and avocado, right? A little bit of sauce, um, but it's not really like a breakfast burrito or taco. It's it's just very unique. It's yeah. it's it's you know their right. kind of staple thing. Uh, and oh my god, are they phenomenal! <laughs> and the best part is like, there's one morning like we stopped at the gas station and got them. Yeah, and I was like, oh, we're getting gas station breakfast, bro. And then I took a bite, and I'm like, oh my. god god <laughs> i'm like this is i love this gas station <laughs> and they're not like fancy like quick trips or buckies or yeah. something like it's got like two pumps and you're like oh, i don't know if i want to go in there <laughs> but yeah the food's phenomenal i have um, a question for you yeah. John. uh did y'all run into like any sharks or anything mm. like that so or one of the, the one of the dives we did on the west side of the island is uh, the dive site's called the west end wall um and it's a it's a deep water island so once you get past the reef it just drops off and it goes like thousands of feet deep um they actually hold a lot of free diving competitions on uh outside the island rotan because it's it's so deep so close to shore right that they don't have to go way out and, and if something happens they have very very close access for you right. know secondary care and stuff like that um but uh so when we were diving West End Wall, it's a drift dive. So that means we, we get off the boat, we get in the water, everyone goes down to depth, we hang out, you know, 50, 60 feet, and the current just kind of brings us along through uh, across the reef. And we just, it's my favorite dive because you don't really have to do anything. Right. You just hang out and you drift and you look at stuff and you conserve a lot of gas and you can, usually your dives are a little bit longer. Um, at the time, the same time we were doing that, there were some guys that, that, uh, you know, friends of warfighter scuba that live on the island that are free divers and they were doing a bunch of training dives just off of that dive site and they were going down and hanging out like so these guys free dive to like 300 plus feet deep it's crazy on one breath they take a breath on the surface they dive down to like 300 feet and they come back up when they do training dives they'll go down to between like 100 and 200 feet and not just like boom hit that and come back up they go like, oh, i just did 200 they'll go down and then just hang out and then come back up. And I'm like, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Not only no, but fuck no. Yeah. Uh, so they were doing these training dives, right? So they're, you know, they were going down and hanging out. You know, I think at this one, they were hanging out at like 130. And uh, so he had a GoPro with him and he showed the videos. And it was probably another 20, 30 feet below him was like an eight to 10 foot hammerhead that was just swimming around. Yeah, and so when we got back like later on that afternoon, he's like, "Hey, do you guys see the that hammerhead?" And we're like, "What?" <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, he's like, yeah, it was off a of West End Wall." We were like, "Oh, that's where we were diving." He's like, oh, "I know." And then so that was like, "What? What depth?" And he's like, "Oh, that, it was probably at like 150." I'm like, "Yeah, we were at 50. Yeah, <laughs> like a big difference, you know." Um. So and then there was a nurse shark that a couple guys saw that was hanging out on one of the dives that we did as well. Uh, I just I wasn't in that area on that time, so I didn't see it. Um. But uh, but you can. There are a good probability, good possibility, to see sharks in some of the, the dive sites. Yeah. Typically, they're on deeper dives. Right. Like you're, you know, eighty to one hundred feet, depending on where you are in the world. But in in Rotan specifically, you're eighty to one hundred feet, hundred ish. Um, you might, depending on where you're at, 
um, on the south side of the island, they actually have a, an operation down there that does shark dives. They're, they don't have the best practices, and that's why we, we don't yeah. do it when we're there. Um, it's, it's very dangerous, especially for guys that if you – the longer you can keep – underwater the better chance you have of seeing it right you know what i mean because it's not like a dinner belt they're not just like okay we're here come come on see us yeah you know what i mean it's like you know they have them in a cage and they let them out you know when the divers are down there they're wild animals you don't know they might not show up who knows um so the the more you can you can conserve your gas the better chance you have seen it because you have a longer bottom time um with the guys with similar disabilities just because of the way that they have to move in the water they naturally expend more energy and go through gas faster. Right. So they have a shorter bottom time. Um, so in the past, this is before I got involved with Warfighter at all, War, Warfighter Scuba. Um, they've done that dive before with the company that, that runs it. And, you know, they're not even down there, you know, 15 minutes. And the guys are already, you know, burning through the tanks at depth. You go through it so fast. And so they already have to start going up and they don't get a chance to see anything. Right. right. You know. And so, and then there's a lot of times that they, they overextend their stay, uh, which leads to, um, the bends essentially decompression, you know, uh, spending too much time at the bottom. Then you got to do longer deco stops to make sure you're doing it safe. Uh, but you don't, you're only carrying one tank. So you don't have enough gas that you're carrying to do it. So the proper way is they just hang tanks for your safety stops and you get up to that and then you breathe off that tank that they have hanging there, but they don't do that. And so it's like, it's a big no-no. Yeah. And yeah, that's why Four Fighter Scuba doesn't do anything. But um, so they're there. Um, it's just yeah. Well, it's where we're diving, they're not baiting. Luck of the draw. Yeah. 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 I get it. Uh, yeah. Cool. So we we had Nick on the show. Then we had uh, Crispy on the show. Yeah. Omar. And then uh, and Omar. Omar yeah. is heavily involved in Warfighter Scuba. Yeah. Too, yeah. And so. You were down there with him and, and Mikey. Mikey was down there with you guys. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, but, I mean, they were all walks of life. There's uh, there actually a bunch of Marines on this trip. Normally, it's opposite. So, Nick is prior Marine. Oh, uh, okay. And normally, his trips are like all Army guys yeah. or Army, Navy, or Air Force or whatever. Right. And this time, it was, I think the Army was outnumbered by Marines. Wow. I think he did it on purpose. Yeah. Um, but I got to meet some <laughs> awesome, awesome people. Um, I met I a mean, guy. Marines are people too. I, I met I met a guy who had a million dollar bounty on his head in Iraq. Yeah, and they actually had to evacuate him out of the country. Like the State Department was like, uh, they they called him on a sat phone. He was contracting. Called him on a sat phone and like, hey, um, you need to be at the airfield and within the next thirty minutes. There's a bird, a brick getting ready, wheels up, waiting for you. Uh, you need to leave this country right now. And he's like, um, uh, okay. And you know, obviously there's other <laughs> right. conversations that would happen. And so he had all of his body armor, he had his weapons, the whole nine on base walking from where he, he was sleeping to the airfield making, you know, eyes everywhere. And, uh, they literally had a bird on the runway running and it was the pilots in the, in the crew waiting for him to get on it, to get him out of the country, him solely, nobody wow. else. And hearing all those stories and going into detail with that, I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, and he lives in Texas. So I'm yeah. like, you have to come on the podcast. Right. <laughs> I need this story. But I need you to tell it because I'll mess it up. So I'm, depending on the schedule, we'll get him down here. Um, that was super cool. Like I said, I got to hang out with Omar a bunch. Um, you know, he's really into diving. Uh, and that's another thing, too, um, that kind of gets, I mean, not really overlooked, but you don't really think of it. Like, so Omar burned over 75% of his body salt water because of his burns in the skin anytime he touches anything it breaks the skin and now he has an open wound and it heals slower he has a higher risk of infection right being in the salt water all those little wounds closed up and healed because it oh. salt water helps with healing right right um it relieves all the joint pain because you have no gravity so now you don't have all the pressure on all your joints the whole time um you know, he's a right leg amputee as well, uh, which is really funny because he needs his leg to get in and out of the water. But when he's in the water, it doesn't, it, he swims better without it. Yeah. And so there was a, the majority of the dives that we did, I had a leg clipped, tucked into my BCD <laughs> and I was swimming around with a leg on. <laughs> so I dove with three legs. Some of the guys only dove with one. Yeah. That's funny. We had a retired, uh, um, 
Sergeant Major from um, Ranger Battalion, Ranger Regiment. Yeah. Uh, that dude, he joined like mid eighties. Yeah. And so, and he's a uh, um, Hawaiian. He's Samoan. So he's all, you know, sleeved out and tattoos everywhere. All this, you know, the traditional tattoos. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's fucking sweet. And so we're the first day we go to get in the water. He takes his shirt off and he's got Ranger tab and he's got jump master wings with a fucking mustard stain. Yeah. And I'm like, motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> for the listeners out there. Mustard stain is combat jump. Uh, not many people get a combat jump. Yeah. There's been a handful since world war two, yeah. like world war two is the last big one. Other yeah. than that, you'd have to be some high speed guys in some very unique places <laughs> or 10th mountain and lucky. Uh, yeah. 82nd lucky. Mm. I think those are the only two that we were, talked about those. Yeah. That, um, that jumped into Iraq because there was a couple, there was a guy that was there on the trip that was on the ground watching them. Yeah. Like they already secured the LZ. Yeah. And they're watching them land and get their mustard stains yeah. as they were like, well, we, what the fuck? Now, <laughs> to be fair, we were in the largest air assault ever conducted. We were. And we landed into a controlled LZ ish controlled well it was, the marines were there they were yeah but we we landed uh and it was more to get us from point a to point b than yeah it was to do like quickly a, yeah we weren't doing an assault or anything like that yeah it was just the biggest the biggest air mobile. they called it an air so the biggest air movement yeah maybe, maybe okay. or air, yeah something like that but yeah that was but it was cool because it was chalk after oh chalk God, after chalk crazy. of helicopters it was pretty we crazy. were probably well, I think we were sitting because we we ended up having to get in the grass and pull security. Yeah, and uh, and I remember we must have been there for fuck an hour and a half as birds were just kept coming in. Yeah, could they come in? They'd land, dump everybody out, and they'd take off. Yeah, next shot, come in, land, dump everybody, and take off for like it felt like forever. <laughs> I mean, it was probably close to a division's worth of people. It, right? Well, it or was maybe a, it was a brigade. Yeah, a brigade. Okay. Yeah, so it was at least it was a roughly eight hundred to a thousand people. Yeah, that 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 they did on that movement. Yeah, it might be more. Who knows? I'm yeah. probably I'm just spitballing based off of right memory. My knowledge <laughs> yeah. as in fucking I think I was an E four at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and he maybe an E four. I remember yeah. I remember that day more getting on the bird than I do getting off the bird. Yeah. Remember, we had to walk across oh, that airfield. Oh, fairy shit himself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm literally, I'm walking behind one of these guys, right? We're walking, literally, we're on an airfield. And a fucking, and, and a helicopter can take off and land pretty easily. Wherever they want. Right. That's the per perk of a helicopter. But us being light infantry, we had, I think we were still in our chemical suits. We definitely were in our chem suits. We, uh, we uh, had, we had our rucksacks and we had our, our salt packs. Yeah. Our rucksacks were probably 90 to 100 pounds. Yeah. The salt packs were probably 50 to 60, yeah. maybe 75. Plus our body armor. Was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, we, and so they're like, okay, they staged us. They dropped us off in vehicles, I think. Those were that. I remember that specifically because in order to get everybody up to start walking, you couldn't get up on your own. No, you had to help. So you, you had, had two guys yeah. that got you to your feet. And as long as you stayed on your feet, you're fine. But if you went down, it took two guys to get you back standing yeah. again. Yeah. And we yeah. probably had to walk a mile. It was the no bullshit a mile. Yeah. Yeah. So we had to walk across the desert, which was an airfield, right? Mm -hmm. Across this desert for a mile carrying all of this shit, which would be fine if it was like you woke up in your bed, you got into work to do PT. And that's what you did for PT. You know, honest, right? honestly, though, but... Let's just put reality to it, yeah. right? When we when the, we when they were like, "Hey, we have to move to the birds." Yeah, everybody get all your shit on, and we got to go that way. Yeah, everybody would have been like, "You know what? This is typical army bullshit." Yeah. Whatever. Let's just fucking go. Yeah, that's the way we were. So we all got up and we put all our shit on and we walked a mile to where the bird was. Yeah. And what happened when we got there? I don't remember. They said, oh, just kidding. This isn't where it's at. You have to go back to where you started. And we all turned around and walked back. You remember that now? Oh, I think I do. Yeah. But what I really remember, <laughs> what I really remember, right? So wearing your chemical suit, your chemical suit, right? Mm -hmm. I think I think we might have just had pants. They're, they're suspenders. Yeah. But I, I don't know if we had the top on or not. We might have just been in brown t-shirts that day. Yeah. And rucks because it's. Yeah. Yeah. But uh we're walking we're walking and like a guy, a couple people in front of me or whatever, right? We're walking. 
And I see this guy, you have quick detach <laughs> things for your rucksack, right? Pops them off, right? Tate starts getting his suspenders off and his pants. He gets his hands on his pants and then he just puts the suspenders back on, <laughs> picks up his rucksack and just keeps walking. Uh, because we were all getting over a bout of dysentery. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there was that. My favorite. <laughs> and, and I don't know. The only the reason I remember this is so that specific person, he was in my team. So I remember all the little bullshit games that he'd play and all the fucking stupid things that he'd say and everything like that. And one of the things that he would say up until that moment, that <laughs> moment stopped it. Is he would I don't even know where he got it from or why he would say it, but he'd be joking around. He'd be like, "Oh, I just shit myself," and he'd say it all the time, all the whether time. he did or he didn't. It didn't matter, well, but he said it all the time. So that happened, and he never said it again, <laughs> <laughs> not once. I think we all did after one hundred percent. So I I remembered something. Uh, apparently, on March twenty six, two thousand three. The 173rd dropped about a thousand guys into Iraq. I'm looking. I yeah, and that airfield was secured by a ranger. That's yeah. I, rem- I remember. Uh, one of my buddies, his dad was part of that yeah. airborne up, and he was like, "Right, oh, my dad has a mustard stain." And one of my team leaders was a prior bat guy, and he was like, "Yeah, he didn't tell you <laughs> yep. the whole story about that." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that kid had a rude. It was kind of like an in-country training jump. You Absolutely, know? yeah. Um, it was one of those ones. I guarantee you, what it was is some. I get, it was probably a battalion commander talked to his brigade commander was like, Hey, sir, I think we, I think we can do this. Yeah. And, and that brigade commander was like, you know what? Let's plan it. And then they planned it all out and they sent it up higher and hires like, you know what? Yeah, go ahead. You got this. Yeah. And then they got on the phone and they're like, Hey, bat boys. Yeah. Go secure this airfield for me real quick. Yeah. Okay, cool. We got a bunch of, yeah, you know. we're about to get a whole bunch of dudes in mustard stain, <laughs> yeah. which I'm sure I can't imagine being a bat guy watching all of these 173rd get their fucking mustard stains because you went and secured yeah. an airship. I, 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 like, so I would appreciate it even more because being that dude on the ground, I know that that's bullshit. Oh, that's true. You know what that's I mean? That's very true. <laughs> yeah. So I was wrong on the largest air assault in history. I was right that it was the 101st. But it happened in Desert Shield, Desert Storm in late 1990. Uh, so let me look up largest air mobile. Air movement, maybe. I think mobile. Mobile, maybe. yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I remember we were in country and I heard the yeah. guys got their mustard stain. And so then I was just like, fuck, they need a mustard stain for air assault wings. You know how many fucking hot shit we air assaulted into? Like. There would but that be doesn't a, work. There would be a whole lot more mustard yeah, in the be, military. It, like right. it doesn't. Yeah. yeah, it's not the same. That's a. Uh, I, I I recently finished watching uh, Band of Brothers with oh, my nice. wife for the first time. Oh, nice. and so like for the, your first time or her first her time? first. Time. Oh, okay, okay. I I I have a tradition where I watch it at least like once a year. I was gonna say that's like required reading oh, here in the military. Absolutely. <laughs> but when they're jumping out of the planes and everything, she's like, "Oh, that's." That's like what you trained to do. I was like, yes, in my entire career. Because I watched Band of Brothers fucking like right before I went to basic right. and airborne school. And I was like, God, I hope I never have to fucking do this shit. Because <laughs> it's just like, it, it's 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 human chaos. skeet shooting. Like It's just <laughs> yeah. like, hey, you're unarmed in the air and you can't go anywhere. Sir, that's against Geneva Convention. That's very true. It's I, weird. The countries that we fight don't really care about Geneva Convention. <laughs> I, I believe I said that exactly to her. I was like, the U.S. is the only one that plays by the rules. <laughs> yeah, we, we play by rules. The other people use them against us. Absolutely. Like We set the rules and we're the only ones that play by them. Yeah. That's that's how war works. But yeah, yeah that was that was one of those where I was just... Because like, that Band of Brothers uh, came out... What, 2001 or 2000? Uh, I think it came out It came out before we deployed. Uh, 2001. Yeah. Yeah. So it came out before we, because I remember I, we, I crushed watching through that right uh, before we went overseas. And I'm like, let's fucking go. Oh, 100%. And then we all got in trouble because we wanted to fucking paint our faces and shave mohawks yep. like they did. And mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't like us. <laughs> all right. We must have been lied to, John. I can't find it anywhere. Really? Yeah. Huh. I'll have to do some more homework to figure out what they call it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, actually, now we have some new capabilities with the podcast. We'll be able to get some more people on the show. We might be able to get our old battalion commander. 
<laughs> that you guys are in for a treat on that one. We don't know if it'll actually air or not, but it'll be a fun conversation. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bunch of jump cuts because shit had to get edited out. Uh, no, no, <laughs> it'll be good. Yeah, um, yeah. Fuck, what were we talking about before? Oh, the, all the Rotan stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there wasn't any like. I think I told this when we, when we had Nick on, we t- talked about uh, he had a, a bathroom break yeah. while we were on a dive. Um, that did not happen this time. Uh, it's unfortunate. I thought it, there was a couple dives where I was like, Whoa, <laughs> like this might. <laughs> but no, it didn't happen. Huh? But yeah, I mean, it was a busy, busy, busy trip. We put in a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, but it was still really fun. Uh, and one of the cool things that with that warfighter scuba does too is is they involve the significant other, um, you know. So we had a, we had I think three or four guys that their wives were down with them diving, yeah. um, which you know that creates a, a bonding experience that they can do wherever you know. Right. They're like the, the guy and the wife want to go on vacation now, they can go, you know, anywhere and dive, whether it's on a lake or the ocean, you know. Yeah. But like it's just something else that they have a you know a common bond with. Um, and the best part is, is when you're underwater, you can't talk. <laughs> it's so quiet. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, uh, but we had a good time. I, I took a cigar on a dive. Oh yeah. Um, and so we'll be posting those pictures up shortly, but, uh, but yeah, so I brought one. I mean, obviously I can't light it and take it with me. Well, it's you struggle really a how it works. Um, I think I have a very good idea of how I could potentially smoke a cigar underwater. Um, I just don't, for one, I, it's not something that I'm like, I have to figure this out. Like, I don't really care. It'd be cool, but it'd be a lot of work to get to yeah. build the apparatus to make it work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I brought one because I wanted to get a picture underwater. Um, cause I, you know, everyone's like, Oh, this is the one thing that you do. You can't smoke a cigar while you're doing. And I'm like, mm, <laughs> well, let's see about that. <laughs> but, uh, so I brought it with me and it was a really, really choppy day and really rough, uh, you know, waves coming in and out. Um, so I was very surprised on how long that cigar stayed together. Right. Uh, before it kind of grenaded. Uh, and it was funny on how it, I'll go through the sequence of how it came apart. Uh, because it was the opposite of how they put it together. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it took probably 15 or 20 minutes before that cigar kind of, you know, I, I had to put it, we were doing a beach cleanup anyway. So I had a, a mesh bag to put all the trash in. So I just put the cigar in so it didn't just yeah. float everywhere. Um, but I got some cool pictures. You know, we were about, I don't know, 30, 40 feet deep uh, with this cigar in my mouth. Um, but uh, the first thing to go, so I had it in cellophane for a while, right? And then I took it out of the cellophane. It was just a cigar. And we did the pictures that, I, and then I was just swimming around, you know, and, and sometimes I had it like this and yeah. just swim in, you know, it wasn't like protecting it. I right. was like, I want to know how long this is going to last. It's <laughs> merged. Right. And, uh, and so the first thing to go is the band, right? The glue yeah. on the band came makes, loose. Makes sense. Yep. And I'm like, oh, cool. Took the band off, put it in my mesh bag. And then I'm, you know, swimming more. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw, I'm like, oh, no, is it coming apart? And I look, and it's just the cap, the little circle piece of tobacco that they put right. on to hold it together. Just the cap was flapping on one side. And so as I rotated the cigar, a, a little bit of a, a wave must have came or a current or something. And the whole thing just went whoop. And it just started floating. And I was like, whoop. And I put that in the bag. <laughs> and then it just started coming from, from the, the head of the cigar. It just started slowly because that glue, once that glue got wet, it started to let go. Then it started slowly unraveling. And uh, and I would try to, like, put it back together. And then, you know, the water would yeah. move and it would start. And I'm like, oh, okay, this isn't going to work anymore. Uh, but the cool part about it is, so when you're at the factory, when you're in Nicaragua or Honduras or, or somewhere in Central America, and you have very, very fresh tobacco, whether it's, um, you know, at some point throughout the aging process before they put it in bales or on the rolling table when they add a little bit of moisture to it to yeah. stretch the wrapper or whatever, you can pick up that tobacco leaf and you smell it. And, oh, my God, does it smell amazing. Yeah. Like that is the one of the best smells in the world is like that fresh tobacco, you know, that that already fermented leaf. Yeah. Um, and so 
we got done with the dive and you know we everybody gets all their gear broken down and everything like that and then we're going to weigh how much trash we found and picked up and so when i reached in the bag i took everything out and i grabbed the cigar separate i'm like no i brought this with me this isn't part of it you can't you know you can't weigh this and so i just had the i had all the loot because at this point it's just a handful of loose tobacco and so i just squeezed it and water came out i'm like oh that's funny and then i was like actually i'm like this is super cool just by looking at it and i'm like uh, this is all like I uh, all of our cigars are long filler, you know, tobacco. I'm like, but I can show you every individual leaf that's in the cigar. And a couple of the guys that we were diving with were like, what? And I'm like, yeah. So I put it on like this little railing and I pick up one piece. And yeah. because it was already wet, I could just stretch the leaves wide open. And they're like, holy sh-. Like that's what's in the cigar. And I'm like, oh, yeah, man. I'm like, this is crazy. You know, and I'm stretching all these leaves and everything. And they're like, that's cool. That's super cool. And uh, And so I grabbed them all up in a pile. And I was just like. Something in my brain was just like, you should smell this. And I was just like, hmm. And I just took all the pile of leaves, put it right up into my nose like you would, you know, yeah. a factory in it. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm like, Mike, because we've broken cigars yeah. down for Mikey before and everything right. like that. And he was there. And I'm like, Mikey, come here. And he's like, what? what? And I'm like, you have to smell this. And he's like, mm. and I, I'm like, no, dude. I'm like, seriously, you have to smell it. And he's like, okay. And he smells it. And he's like, holy shit. <laughs> like, that smells so good. <laughs> There was, but I did not expect that. Yeah, because um, I would think it would smell like salt water. That's the only thing that was going through my like. I know what my gear smells like if I yeah, don't yeah. rinse it with fresh water. Right. You know, I don't want my cigar to. So that's yeah. what, But man, it smelled so good. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, oh, um, I wish I would have had. I almost want to try it now, where I bring now maybe next trip, and because it's going to take days to get to the point where I could smoke it again. Right. But to go take it, get it completely soaked in the water, to so let it, it dry would have out. to taste like salt water. But would it be bad? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like if imagine, because the water is going to evaporate and the salt's still going to be there. I was yeah, thinking. but imagine like when you smoke like a like a, a crow and you're like, man, that's got some pepper and spice to yeah. it. Yeah. Have you ever smoked a cigar and you're like, oh, that's salty? Never. You know what I yeah. mean? So uh, it's like a pretzel, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so I might try it next time. I might take a minute man yeah. and just and then let it sit out and try to. You know, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll see. I got a lot that it opened my mind to a lot of things. And I'm like, oh man, I can I can experiment with this. Well, it leads me to a conversation that I had with Jim that I, I'll talk to you offline about. Okay, I got a plan. Cool. Uh, but yeah. Any questions on the? Uh, uh, on anything? Yeah, we got a couple questions. Okay. Uh, these are coming from uh, the old Spotify. So if you're listening on Spotify, scroll down a little bit. You can drop us some questions. Uh, this one comes from Jose. He says, compared to cigarettes, do cigars have less or more nicotine in them? And how can you generally tell what kind of cigars have more nicotine in them? Like, does a bold cigar have more than a mild cigar? Uh, so I'll, I'll tackle this. Go for it. Uh, so a cigar, d- depending on the cigar, but like say you take an average Toro size. Uh, supposedly. Allegedly. It, Allegedly, <laughs> it has as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. Which, you know, if you weigh out all the tobacco, it makes sense, right? It's probably very yeah. proportionate no, right. to a pack of cigarettes and of tobacco. Yeah. Now, the cigarettes, they add a bunch of other bullshit, which yeah. is what's bad Additives. For you. And- nicotine by itself isn't necessarily bad for you. Hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people use like nicotine gum for concentration and all kinds of Or stuff, as a right? stimulant. Yeah. Uh, it's like caffeine, right? You know, so, caffeine is not bad for you, in theory. Well, in in yeah, in mo- in moderation. Moderation. Yeah. Yep. So, um, uh, what was the follow-on of that? Uh, how can you tell which cigars have more oh, nicotine? And do bolder cigars have more nicotine? So, the answer is kind of yes, because typically your lajero leaves are going to be on the top of the plant. They're going to be picked last, which means as they pick the leaves from the bottom, all the nutrients are going to the top of the leaves. The top leaves are smaller, but they're thicker, and they have more nicotine yeah, in them. More concentrated. Yeah. Yep. And so Boulder, maybe not, yes, but Lajero and the higher leaves, the taller primings that you have, yeah. definitely have more than the lower primings. Right. So... I think the, possibly the biggest difference in this question, because this it's a it seems like it's a very straightforward question, but there's so much that goes into the difference between cigarettes and cigars yeah. 
that it's it's actually way more complicated than hey is it more or less nicotine right are are you ingesting more nicotine exactly. in a cigar the answer is probably no because you, your lungs when you inhale the smoke are going to absorb way more all of that stuff way more than just your mouth is yep you know but do you absorb nicotine when you smoke a cigar absolutely yep um and if you've ever gotten that dizzy feeling or whatever that's the nicotine yeah and what it and what that that leads me into this right because i just told the customer that was smoking cigars forever and he didn't the sugar know, trick yeah the sugar yep. trick right yep. so what if you start getting dizzy or or get that green feeling smoking a cigar uh what it what it's doing is the nicotine is tricking your body into thinking that you're having a blood sugar problem so your body's compensating for a blood sugar problem but that's not what's going on so to neutralize that you eat sugar and then like five minutes later you feel fine it counters the, the yeah. nicotine buzz effect yeah. yeah so but and then another thing to just to touch on this because it's i i find it near and dear because i used to be i mean i smoked cigarettes for i don't even know how long i i chewed for i don't even know how long um but i quit chewing fuck i don't even know four years ago yeah. Now maybe yeah i remember when he quit um and I just woke up one day and I was like, I don't want to chew anymore. Yeah. And it sucked for a couple, you know. Yeah, you were grumpy. Four or five days. But after that, it was just like, like I mentally I already knew, like I'm not doing this anymore. I just have to yeah. get past this initial curve. I don't wake up in the morning like I used to wake up when I smoked or when I chewed. And it was like, fuck, I need a cigarette or oh, fuck, I need to put a chew in right now. Right. You know. Right. I, you don't wake up and be like, oh, I have to have a cigar. I need a you cigar right now. Yeah. You don't get out of bed to have and a then cigar. go. Yeah. You, you go. You, you skip everything. You don't. You might pee, but normally I'd wake up. I'd I'd take do a morning pee and I'd immediately go outside and light up a cigarette. Yeah. Or I'd immediately throw a chew in and then continue doing whatever we know. But I wake up now and, and there's days where I don't have a cigar. Yeah. And there's days where I smoke 20 of them, like at a trade show. Yeah. And then I get back from the trade show and I don't smoke a cigar for three or four days. So, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. even though there's nicotine in it. Well, the major difference is you don't smoke. A, I don't smoke after a trade show because you get sick. Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> I didn't this last one somehow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you did. Uh, but I did. Uh, remind me of that. After I get done with the, the difference real quick because uh, I, I got a part it relates to Rotan okay. Scuba. Um, but so even though you're ingesting nicotine, it's getting absorbed into your body out of cigars. It's not, you don't have that same level of addiction that you would have with a cig with cigarettes or with chew yeah. because there's so much other shit that they put in there that magnify the addiction. Right. Because their goal is literally their goal is we want you hooked on our product. Yeah. Our goal is with cigars is we want to give you a premium product that you can enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. But you're not going to get hooked on it. Like, right. it's just not how it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so to touch back on the, the the Vegas crud. Yeah. So we got back from the trade show. You got sick. Yeah. I think Michelle got sick. Dave got sick. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, because I had to go to Honduras. Yeah. And if you can't really scuba dive if you're sick because you can't equalize your ears if you're congested. Right. And uh, so luckily the first few days we were there because all the training dives that we had to do, we were only going like 15 feet uh, just to do the training stuff. And at 15 feet, I was, it was getting more difficult than normal because I had some yeah. congestion going on. But by the end of the week, I was totally fine. Yeah. When we did our deep dives, it did nothing matter. Yeah. But the beginning of the week, I'm like, oh, motherfucker, if I'm, it's like, I hope I'm still not getting, <laughs> and then I started clearing up more and more and I'm like, okay, good. Yeah. So I, I don't know if it was allergies or crud, but yeah. there was something. <laughs> but I wasn't dying like you guys were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're Michelle's just now getting over it. Yeah. Know? It's a it was a weird, weird bug or whatever we yeah. had. Um but yeah, cigarettes are bad. Cigars are delicious. I yeah. Mean, we'll leave it at that. Yep. So any other questions? We got one more. Cool. Um, this one is what is a challenge in business that you overcame and how? Oh god. <sighs> Where do you want to start? Um, what's, I mean, there's what's a good one that's PG? I know, right? <laughs> there's, there's so many. Um, a challenge in business that we overcame. Um, I think just in general with business, um, a it's challenging enough just to figure out what the fuck to do. Yeah. 
because there's no book that's just like this is how you do a cigar brand or this is how you do a yeah, yeah. this or this there's is how general you do that. business yeah. books but but figuring out how, how to adapt it to your specific product or industry or yeah. or whatever you know you could be a marketing company or you could be a retail like there's so much there's so many different parts of it and i think one of the biggest things to that is to to overcome when you first get into it is learning yeah like there there has to be this extremely steep learning curve um and you have to be okay with changing a direction based on knowledge that you've gained um you know if you if you're just stuck in your ways and you're like no this is how we've always done it this is the only way it's going to work or this is it and you're not open minded enough to look at it from a different angle like it's not it might not work <laughs> Then one of the things I did before we started the cigar company was I went to the cigar trade show Mm -hmm. and uh, I learned a lot at that trade show. And I think that was um, invaluable. Yeah. So if you're, you're, whatever industry you're thinking about getting into, go to the trade show. Every industry has one. Yeah. Every single one. Yeah. Like if you want to, if you want to grind stumps, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's an equipment fucking trade show somewhere that. And even for like, you know, there, there's so much stuff that's on social media right now. Like, I guarantee you, almost all of our listeners, you've seen a post somewhere where some guy was talking about, you know, I quit my nine to five and I started my own painting company or my own landscape or my own this. It was some sort of sort of a yeah. service based company where essentially they're buying minimal equipment, putting sweat equity into gaining customer base yeah. and then grinding it out and making money, you know, and like now I'm free and I make, you know, six figures or whatever it is. Even those industries have trade shows. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like it doesn't yeah. matter what you do. There's a trade show somewhere. And <clears throat> if you want to know what that industry is doing, you want to learn how they're marketing, you want to learn whatever, everybody has it and it's right there on display. Well, I think one of the one of the key things that you should look at if you're thinking about getting into business is it, is it scalable, mm-hmm. right? At what level will you top off? Yeah. And if you top off at a certain level where you have to work 80 hours a week and – you know, like owning the gun store, right? Mm-hmm. I, yeah, it's scalable. But like I would have had to bring in millions and millions of dollars of financing. Yeah. Which, and then and then it's still a crapshoot. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, it just wasn't, it was something I knew. It was something I was compassionate about. But yeah. it wasn't scalable until right. I got into manufacturing. Yeah. Right? Until you get into, you know, stuff like the that. creation of the product. Yes. Not just retail. Not just retail. Yep. Um, you know, if you get into retail, make sure that the product has good margins, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and make sure you are not opening a place that's in an already saturated market. Yeah. You know, if you, if, if, for for example, if they're, if you're looking at a product and the margins are 20%, right? So, okay. You look at another product and the margins are 50%. Well, then you have to do 30% more work to make the same amount of money. Yeah. Like you know, and and look fuck. at and look at the 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 market space of of whatever industry you're getting into. Also, yeah, you know, if you're getting in, in, into an industry and you're like, oh man, the margins are phenomenal, right? Like for yeah. instance, scuba diving, right? Uh, I learned a lot on this trip about scuba diving. I learned a little bit about how they structure, you know, their their products and their pricing and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, wow, like there's a good amount of margin in some of this equipment. But then you really think about it and you're like, yeah, I mean, this thing, this people all around the world scuba dive and every, you know, blah, 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 and all this stuff. But it's kind of like guns. Like I have all my equipment. Am I going to buy a second set? Am I going to get more? Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like my, my reg sets, uh, retail, my, my regulator sets like a thousand bucks. Am I going to go get a second one just in case? No, I'm just going to get mine serviced. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it's the same thing with guns. Like you have some guys that I'm a gun collector. I have 50 guns. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, what about you? Oh, I just shoot guns. Okay. How many do you have? I have one. Yeah. Well, you want any more? They're like, mm, I like this one. Yeah. You know? Right. So it's like, no, the gun industry is a little bit different, yeah. but I was just using scuba as so, example. For example, like cigars versus coffee, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot more coffee drinkers. Yeah. It's a it's a industry that's not nearly as regulated, right? Uh, marketing wise, it, cigars are completely regulated. You know, yeah. like I can't pay on Facebook to advertise. I can't, yeah. You know, I I can't do that kind of stuff. Right. And it, you know, if if you can find an industry 
that you can do that kind of stuff, it'll work. Yeah. It, you know? Yeah. But, but then you got to look at, look at how the industries work too. And I'm really interested in diving just because we were talking about it a lot, but you know, you look at a dive shop here in San Antonio, right? There's two lakes you can dive in. They're not the greatest. So even though there's only two lakes and they're not the greatest, the majority of the money is made off of courses, getting people certified, yep. getting them advanced courses after they're certified, organizing trips and, and getting people to go on these trips that are, that are run through that dive shop. Right. Right. The sales of equipment. It's, it, I mean, it's obviously it's money, but that's, they can't survive solely on oh, all I do is sell stuff. Yeah. You know, like if I'm looking at equipment, I'm not going to my local dive shop. I'm going to look online. I'm going to find out what equipment that I want. Yeah. And then I'm going to find out where, where I can, I mean, there's a million dive sites that you can get on Amazon. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, well, and, and like even in the gun industry, right? We like, we didn't start making good money until we did Syracuse services until we started teaching classes. Yep. Until we started having a range. Because you know what I mean? the like, overhead, the investment for that was different than the, you know, we didn't have to spend a thousand dollars to make a hundred. Right. You know, we had to do some labor. Yeah. Have some time. We had time. We yeah. had labor. We had initial investment for equipment set up. Yeah. Um, you know, but it wasn't that constant, you know, purchasing of inventory and right. selling it with a, a small margin. Yeah. No. Yeah. So I don't know. Business stuff like that. You know, you know, I constantly I'm looking at businesses. Right. Like. But trying to it's not easy trying to find yeah. trying to find that product or that service, you know, it. it, it like I said, I, I, I constantly look, you yep. it's not easy to like say, okay, like, I think I can, you know, this would be easy. Right. right. You know, like one of the best industries that I've read about are, are storage units, yep. right? Your initial investment. And then man, it's just, it, you print money. The problem is you have to put it in a location, the location and you, and, and the initial investment and you have, to have <laughs> five acres, yeah. you know, like it's, and if you want, and if you want it close to a populace, it's fucking expensive. It's five acres are fucking and if expensive. It's cheap. Good luck filling your units. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So it's, uh, you know, like there's, you know, so, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Capital. That's a hard one. Yeah, capital and due diligence. Yeah, those are the two biggest things to focus on if you're going to start. Make sure you know the industry and know what you're getting into. You know, and like, I don't know. We've we've taken on partners in the past and stuff, and. And my advice is if you have a partner, make sure they have some sweat equity yeah. into it. Uh, it's the only way I see that it works. Right. You know, um, if it's just either, yeah, it's hard to know the right person. It's yeah. hard to know the right person and it's hard to do it by yourself. So you're it's just business. Is just hard. hard. <laughs> it's hard. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it yeah. and they'd all be successful. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that are doing it. But not all of them are successful. Oh, and there's, like, look at Evan. Evan failed a couple businesses, right? Uh, oh, Evan Hafer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I've I've failed yeah. two other businesses. I've had other businesses in the past that didn't. Yeah. Nope. You know, you just. My grandfather was a serial entrepreneur. So he he was in World War II. Yeah. He got back from that. He went to uh, Alabama, got a degree in civil engineering. And then after that, he had fucking gas stations, construction companies. He did all, he worked for the unions for a while. Like he did all this shit. Um, and then what he, he eventually threw out all the other businesses he had, he worked a deal where he did some construction job and trade for some property um, that at the time was just in the middle of fucking nowhere and nobody used it. He was just like, yeah, whatever, it'll pay off. Yeah. You know, property never goes down in value. So eventually, you know, someday I'll be able to make more than what you, know, you right. would initially charge me for this job. So, yeah. And uh, so he sat on the property for years and then uh, decided that he was going to put a hotel on it. And he started with a comfort inn and he got the whole thing built up and running the whole nine. And then he put a holiday in on the same property as well. And then a whole bunch of shit happened and, you know, business, everything yeah. could be taken from me in a blink of an eye. Yep. Um, and so uh, essentially that's kind of what happened along with the short of the story. Um, but it was his, everything that he ever done was in some way, shape or form. He had a business going on, whether it was a side gig or his full time or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, if he was alive today, like, were they successful? And he'd be like, well, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> it just depends. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So, yeah. 
Yeah, business is hard. But it's fun. It's yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Um, is that it for the uh That's all that we had. Cool. Awesome. Um, did I miss any good ones from last week? Any good what? Questions? Oh, I don't remember them. I figured as much. Yeah, there was quite a few though. Um Oh, John, you want to throw out any knowledge uh, as far as pipe tobacco and smoking pipes? Yeah, that was, was, you know, are we ever going to do pipe tobacco? Uh, No, maybe, but no. I think what was the difference in pipe tobacco versus cigar tobacco? I believe that was. And I said I had no idea. Yeah, there's a big big difference. Um, um, I'm not as familiar. My my other grandfather, my dad's side, uh, smoked pipes forever i actually still have some of his tobacco from before he passed and that's been i don't even know 10 years now i've had it yeah um maybe less than that but yeah about four or five years. yeah maybe five years now uh but i just i rehumidified it because it was really dry when i got it so i throw some hum- humidification packs in a jar and rehumidified it um now that it's here actually jazz is a, is a cigar or a cigar a pipe smoker uh, but that's way more knowledge than I do. So I want to give him some of that tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. And see. Um, but I, yeah, I just don't know enough about the pipe tobacco process and what, how did yeah. I have no idea. I know that it's not long, long leaf tobacco. Yeah. It, it's obviously starts its life as long leaf, but then it's cut up and it's blended and mixed and, and there's artificial flavors and some depending on the tobacco, but some of it is just natural. Um, but it's age different. Like there's yeah. so much, there's so much that's different too. Yeah. Uh, we got another one. Uh, when traveling to the factory, what's the best and worst part? Uh, well, the, just the most simple part of that answer. The best part is the drive to the factory. The worst part is the drive back to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much what I said. Um, but so my best, my favorite experience in a factory is we walk into some of the rooms in the factory and then just the the natural smell of the tobacco yeah uh is amazing and smoking that first cigar that you when you the first day you get there yep. you pick it right off the table I and you like that i said the same oh, that's thing so good yeah you know i love i love hanging out with the workers yeah. um you know john and i are very self deprecating when we get there <laughs> and we try to get him to laugh at us you know i, mean, I don't uh, think we try uh, I think yeah, we, it's I think natural. we attempt to do what they're doing, and they laugh at us, and we're totally okay yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I think the worst part is always leaving. Yeah, it really is, and it's not because it's like, like I, I, the worst part is leaving because of the relationships that we built with the people that that are in the factory, whether it's the workers or. Um, you know, Gonzalo who runs it. Yeah. Um, you know, his right hand people, like all of that, the dry, even the driver. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's probably the worst part is like, I'm here for a week at least with you guys, and we build a great relationship and friendship. And then now I have to leave and I don't yeah. know when I'm going to see you. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm going to see you again, but it's, that could be in a month, that could be in six months. Like, yeah. You know, um, but yeah. They, uh, speaking of cigar factories, there is a quote unquote cigar factory on the island of Roatan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it is not a cigar factory. Um, and uh, they were very expensive cigars for what they were. Um, they, uh, I don't know for sure, but I'm willing to bet that they were factory seconds from a factory on the mainland honduras and they were just slapped a roatan cigar company band on it yeah jacked them up and we're selling them to tourists yeah um but it was funny because like every time we there was two two of those shops uh that were close to the some of the areas that we were in and every time we walked by them like all the guys were like oh you want to go get cigars i'm like uh and I'm like, fuck. I'm like, now I know how other people feel when I give them shit endlessly about something. Yeah. Like they're doing it to me now and they know the answer, yeah. you know? And I'm just like, ah, oh, okay. I got to play the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, they, n- nothing in a humidor. It's just, everything's on a shelf. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, but then again, it's, it's very humid there. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's definitely warmer. Uh, so they didn't, and not many places have AC just because yeah. it's like crazy expensive. Yeah, for electricity on the island uh, when it's on. <laughs> There's a lot of times when it's <laughs> off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like a storm came through and knocked the power out for like six hours. And it all st- happened in front of one place because they have the big rat's nest of wires on the uh, poles. Yeah. And a tree branch hit it and knocked the power out. And it took them like five hours to fix it. And uh, so, but a lot of places have generators. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Nick was like, yeah, the night crew was out there at like 2.30 in the morning. I'm like, was there really a night crew? <laughs> and he's like, no, really, there was. And I'm like, was it one guy with a bucket truck that was just like, yep, it's broke. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, I guess that's probably enough for today. Yeah. Quick little recap. Smoked scar into water. I still don't know Spanish. Yeah. I definitely need to learn it. Yeah. I go to too many Spanish-speaking places now. I know. Not know it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess, well, I guess the guy did try to start a cigar lounge down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it did It, it did not last at all. Yeah. Um, one bit. Uh, but I met some guys that live on the island that smoke cigars. Um, and, uh, and when they get, like, a cigar from the States, it's, like, gold to them. Yeah. Because it's so hard to get cigars there. Yeah. And yeah, it's really funny. Like he, they have their their family mule cigars down for them right. and stuff. <laughs> and I was laughing. Well, well, you get, get Nick a little side hustle. The import taxes are so much; they'd be very expensive cigars. <laughs> See when you mule them. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I just bring them down cigars every time. It just pays for my trip. There you go. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, yeah. Until next week. Um, yeah. Go to warfightertobacco.com. Get some cigars. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.